Okay, hi everyone, afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, kidney disease in the ICU, but more particularly um, when we need to provide renal replacement therapy for the patient. It's when the kidneys get sick, what is it that we're supposed to do? Well, um, I think the most important thing to realize is that it's not an, um, an insignificant problem with um, acute kidney injury in the ICU. And for many years, people used to say that people would die with acute kidney injury rather than from acute kidney injury. And we've, become, we've come to realize over the years that it is actually um, an independent risk factor for mortality once the patient in the ICU develops acute kidney injury. So what is acute kidney injury? Well, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Aiken criteria and the rifle criteria um, that have been defined over the last 20 years or so. Um, but the most recent criteria that we use today is the Cadigo criteria to define what we mean by acute kidney injury. And people are classified or stratified depending on um, their serum creatinine or their urine output. And they can be classified as either stage one, stage two, and stage three, with stage one acute kidney injury being relatively mild and stage three being much more severe, whether aneuric or, or um, have a, um, the need for renal replacement therapy or a large increase in serum creatinine. Um, so these are the latest um, classification that, that we should be talking about. I know still the literature does lag behind a little bit and we still talk about Aiken and Kidigo, uh, beg your pardon, Aiken and Rifle, but in actual fact Kidigo is what we should be discussing. And you need to realize that it's, it's the worst of the two um, categories that de de defines a stage of acute kidney injury. So for example, although my creatinine may still be normal, but I become oliguric or aneuric, then although when by the, because creatinine obviously lags behind the clinical picture, if, my, if I'm aneuric for more than 12 hours, even though my creatinine may still be within um, normal limits, when you test the creatinine, um, my um, urine output being aneuric will define that I'll be in stage three rather than stage one or stage two. So it's the worst of the two um, descriptors that defines which category or which stage of acute kidney injury you fall into. So if we look at how much of a, of a problem is acute kidney injury, back in 2015, this multi-center multi, multi um, study was performed in 33 countries, the AK, AKI EPI study. So it's an epidemiological study. And it looked at almost 2,000 patients in over, in over 90 ICUs over the period of one week. And it was found that in these um, patients in ICU, 57% of them developed acute kidney injury. More severe um, stages of stage three was the commonest with 30% of these patients um, being classified as stage three acute kidney injury, with stage one, 18%, and stage two, almost 9%. And if you looked at the etiology of what caused the acute kidney injury in these patients, sepsis was in 40% and was the most common cause of acute kidney injury, followed closely behind by hypovolemia. And you have to realize that it's not just costly in terms of, of um, money that we have to spend on making these patients better, it's also costly in terms of patients' outcome and the risk of mortality. So this is a mortality adjusted odds ratio, um, depending on when you're in stage one, stage two, or stage three of acute kidney injury. And you can see that by the time you get to stage three, your mortality um, adjusted odds ratio has gone up to 6.8 um, times. So you're um, much more likely to to die if you develop stage two or stage three acute kidney injury. So not only is it associated with a higher um, cost in terms of financial um, issues when we have to, to provide renal replacement therapy for these patients, it's also associated with a, an increase in mortality, an increased length of stay, and also a higher serum creatinine at discharge with many patients not actually returning to a baseline. So why do patients die from acute kidney injury and not just with acute kidney injury? Because surely you think, well, you could actually provide dialysis. Doesn't that solve everything? Well, yes, dialysis does go some way to trying to ameliorate some of the, the side effects of acute kidney injury, but patients will still die from volume overload, acidemia, electrolyte disorders. And then also remember that it's a pro-inflammatory state. By the time you get acute kidney injury, um, there is a pro-inflammatory pro mediators that are circulating, and these can have systemic consequences um, by, and, and we cause what we call um, 
um, well, multi-organ failure, because it's not just the kidneys that are affected by the disease process. The circulating cytokines and pro-inflammatory mediators can also infect other organs like the liver, like the kidneys, uh, beg your pardon, like the lungs, like the heart, for example. In addition, uremic toxins may impair immunity. And I'm sure you well remember that patients who have chronic kidney disease all have an impaired immunity because of the, the accumulation of uremic toxins. And it's very likely that patients with acute kidney injury have similar impairments in, in immunity. And then at the end of my lecture, I'm going to touch on a little bit about drug dosing in acute kidney injury, because it can be very difficult to gauge if a patient has um, renal failure, how much of a drug do you give? Um, and I think a lot of our previous misconceptions in the past have actually caused patients more harm than good um, in certain circumstances by cutting back on the drug that we want to give to the patient because we're worried about accumulation and toxicity. Okay, so as I mentioned, so what? So what if a patient gets acute kidney injury? We can always dialyze them. And most emphatically, yes, you can, but it, dialysis does not solve the underlying problem. So yes, dialysis is something we can offer our patients to try and help um, ameliorate some of the complications of acute kidney injury, but it's not a panacea. And the important thing to realize is that Dialysis does not necessarily reduce mortality because it doesn't alleviate the underlying problem. It doesn't entirely reverse these, these hazards. It does not fix the kidneys and it's only supported management. So it's not a magic fix, but yes, it can buy you a bit of time until the kidneys start to, to fix themselves. So you'll notice now that I've, I've, I've introduced the um, acronym RRT, the stands for renal replacement therapy. We used to talk about hemodialysis and hemofiltration, but the correct term these days is RRT or renal replacement therapy. So let's look a little bit more closely at renal replacement therapy. So, I mean, obviously we flip back and forth between dialysis and renal replacement therapy, but I just want to give you a little bit of a, of a, a definition as to what dialysis is and be thankful that this isn't a, a tutorial where you're all in the room with me because I'd be asking questions if it were. So dialysis is where you alter the concentration of the solute in the blood by exposing the blood to another solution, which is called the dialysate, across a semi-permeable membrane. And it relies on the principles of diffusion and ultrafiltration to remove um, fluid and, um, and, and harmful particles like urea and hydrogen ions, for example. So just to show you what renal replacement therapy does on this little cartoon, I'm going to show you dialysis versus hemo or ultrafiltration. And on, on, on the right, uh, so on the left of the picture um, is um, the, the blood passing in the circuit. And on the right side of each cartoon is the, um, the dialysis circuit to which you connect the patient. So the green blobs are low molecular weight proteins and the, the yellow blobs are urea, which is a much smaller molecule. So if you look at what happens with dialysis, blood will flow in one direction. And in, to, in order to try to improve the efficiency of, of, of clearance, then we flow a dialysate in a countercurrent direction. And what this does is it, it has the um, ability to remove molecules. Molecules will move across a semi-permeable membrane. You can see some of the proteins lag behind because they can't fit through the, through the semi-permeable filter, but smaller molecules like urea are easily removed um, with dialysis. How hemofiltration differs. So yes, you have the blood moving in a different direction, but you have an adjustable pressure that's downstream. So this adjustable pressure kind of squeezes the, the, the circuit and has the effect of, of, of building up a driving pressure, which helps to move the flow of fluid and larger molecules across a semi-permeable membrane. And you can see here that what is skimmed off is called the ultrafiltrate. And in some of the more rudimentary circuits, you may not have anything on the other side of the circuit. So fluid can easily move across and it takes with it larger molecules such as low molecular weight proteins and also um, drugs like antibiotics, for example, they are, are going to get removed with dialysis and hemofiltration. So by and large, if you mostly want to remove solutes, we need to dialyze the patient. Whereas if you want to remove fluids, you can see here more water is moving across the semi-permeable membrane now and taking with it solvent, solutes then to remove fluids, 
we're going to try and uh, to um, devise a, a mechanism by which we can ultra filtrate the patient. So you might have heard us saying that when we want the renal team to get involved um, in the care of our patients, that we want fluid taking off, but their um, biochemistry may be acceptable where we don't want the patient to undergo a lot of dialysis because their solutes may be okay. And this, for example, is a patient who's got um, profound fluid overload, who may be very oliguric and you need to take off a lot of fluid. On the other um, hand is patients who have um, very high ureas um, and high um, potassiums, for example, you want to move, remove solutes, then we tend to offer them um, dialysis rather than hemofiltration. You can combine the two into a technique called hemodiafiltration, where you combine dialysis with high volume ultrafiltration. And you can manipulate hemodiafiltration to take off fluid or solutes or both, depending on what you want to achieve with your particular patient. So I just want to show you a little bit about the evolution of renal replacement therapy. Um, back in the 1950s, only hemofiltration was, was um, developed and hemodialysis did not become available until the late 1960s. And these were both intermittent techniques and it was actually only in 1977 that continuous dialysis techniques were, were developed. And I'll say more about those later and the benefits and the, or the pros and cons of each, each technique. So one of the first techniques of trying to um, provide dialysis to the patient was to provide an arteriovenous technique. So this was the first described continuous renal replacement therapy. And the, I'm going to show you a little diagram to explain this, but basically you can, an artery was cannulated and a vein was cannulated. And the patient's own blood flow pushed the blood across the filter. So here you cannulate an artery Here's your dialysis machine with just a very sim simple um, semi-permeable membrane and filter. And the, the, the patient's own blood pumps the blood across the filter. What is skimmed off is the ultrafiltrate. And then um, carrying on with the circuit, the cleansed blood, if you like, was returned to a vein. The problem is, is that because there was no pumps in the system, the systolic pressure you needed to drive the blood across the filter and back to the patient was in excess of 90 millimeters of mercury. And you're well aware by now that we get many patients in ICU who need to be dialyzed or have renal replacement therapy. You have very low blood pressures and they just cannot drive the blood around a whole circuit. It wasn't in a very efficient system either with urea clearance being very low. So in order to overcome the poor clearance, um, a counter current flow of, ultra, of, of um, dialysate was, was introduced. So again, there's no pump in the system. The patient's own um, pump pumps the, the blood across the artery. The dialysate is pumped across in, in the other side of the membrane um, around the um, so that the blood flows in one direction, the dialysate flows in the other direction. And what's skimmed off is called ultrafiltrate. And again, the blood is returned to the patient in a vein. So this was more efficient um, and improved the clearance of products such as urea. But again, it's quite a rudimentary, simple system. So looking at arteriovenous and arteriovenous hemodiafiltration when it becomes continuous, it's seldom used today. It was a really large cannula that was used to achieve the arterial cannulation. And that caused a lot of pay problems with the femoral arteries um, with up to a 15 to 20% morbidity of damage to the femoral artery. So it wasn't something that people really liked to take um, very likely to putting patients on arteriovenous um, dialysis. As I mentioned, you need an adequate blood pressure. And these days we now have these peristaltic blood pumps and double lumen catheters that have made things much simpler. This is what the catheter looks like um, these days when we're doing a, a veno-venous technique, and I'll show you more about this now. But you see there's an arterial lumen where blood is taken into the machine. Um, and then there's a venous lumen where the blood is given back to the patient. And I want you to realize that when you cut one of these hemodialysis catheters in a cross-sectional area, this is what it looks like. So there's an arterial lumen and a venous lumen that are completely distinct from one another and there's no mixing in between. So here you put this in a, in a patient's vein and what they call the arterial lumen, it's obviously venous blood, but the blood gets um, withdrawn from the patient, pumped around the hemodialysis machine and pumped back in through the venous lumen, okay? 
So this is what veno-venous hemofiltration looks like. You've got this arterial intake lumen with now a little um, peristaltic pump. So the pump pumps and the blood is forced across the filter. What comes across the filter and, and is removed um, by passing across the semi membrane is the ultrafiltrate. And then the pump drives the um, blood back in through the venous return lumen to the patient. Again, rather like the arteriovenous hemodiafiltration, um, better techniques have, have been developed whereby the blood um, is exposed to the dialysate, which is also pumped in a countercurrent direction to try to improve clearance. So the dialysate gets moved, uh, moved in one direction and the blood in the other, and then the, the cleansed blood, if you like, are returned by the venous lumen. Okay, so you need to be aware about when we need to provide renal replacement therapy in a hurry, because quite obviously, if you're in charge of a unit at night or you get a new patient come in, you need to know when we need to provide um, dialysis quickly. And the indications for urgency, emergency dialysis can be divided into absolute indications and relative indications. So the absolute indications are a high potassium. Classically, it's talked about a potassium that's greater than 6.5, but it may be lower than this if the potassium is rapidly rising. If the patient has a metabolic acidemia with a pH of less than 7.2, that is due to metabolic causes, predominantly renal causes, because if the patient has a hyperlactatemia that is causing a metabolic acidemia, then dialysis is not the, not the answer. Because yes, the dialysis will remove lactate to some degree, but you need to address the underlying problem as to why the patient has a, has a high lactate. Uremic complications such as bleeding, pericarditis, and cephalopathy are, are indications for emergency dialysis, as is um, resistant pulmonary edema or refractory fluid overload. And then we can also provide hemodialysis or hemofiltration for the ingestion of various toxins. Um, and often you'll get a patient admitted to ICU who needs dialysis to remove the toxins. Relative indications include oligoanuria, um, hypermagnesemia if the patient's aneuric and they have loss of tendon reflexes. Again, not something we commonly encounter in the ICU. Some texts say there are indications, relative indications for emergency dialysis if your urea is very high or your creatinine is very high. But by and large, we don't practice that at Krotoskia just because of um, resource limited environment. So our um, renal team really want um, to, uremic complications to be present rather than just a re raised urea. Obviously, if you're concerned that the patient has um, a rapidly worsening electrolyte situation, such as occurs in rhabdomyolysis or particularly tumor lysis syndrome, then you can also institute emergency dialysis. And finally, and it's important for us in ICU because of the concept of fluid creep in our ICU patients, with all the best will in the world, trying to run patients um, uvolemic in the ICU is very difficult. They get fluids for sedation, muscle relaxation in the COVID era, antibiotics, feeding, and creating volume for these patients is crucial because we don't want to stop their enteral nutrition or any of their other medication and develop a, a soggy fluid overloaded patient. Just quickly to touch on hemoperfusion. So hemoperfusion is the dialysis of toxins. And usually we use an activated charcoal circuit where the blood flows through a very similar circuit as you see, as you, you've just seen with the um, continuous techniques or the intermittent techniques. But instead of the normal filter, we have a charcoal, activated charcoal inside the filter instead of the dialysis membrane. You still, the patient still has to have heparinization because the patient, the, the extracorporeal circuit can still clot. And one of the important side effects of, hemo, of hemoperfusion particularly charcoal hemoperfusion, is the development of hypoglycemia because glucose can adsorb onto your charcoal um, um, filter. In addition, it can also stuff up your platelets and thrombocytopenia can be quite common. So, but that's just a little bit aside and not really for mainstream today in the talk of acute kidney injury. So if we look at different modalities, which is better? Should we be providing continuous techniques to our patients? or should we be going with intermittent techniques? So just to explain the difference, and it's quite obvious, but you'd be surprised at how often people stumble over this when they're asked in, a, in their end of block assessments. 
So continuous renal replacement therapy is where the patient is dialyzed for 24 hours a day. They are dialyzed continuously. And the nice thing with this is it allows for very smooth hemodynamic control and smooth metabolic control. You don't expose the patient to a quick rush job where you're having to take off a lot of fluid very quickly over the course of about three or four hours, which can um, drop your blood pressure quite dramatically in the critically ill patient. So with continuous renal replacement therapy, you get better or more smooth hemodynamic control. And yes, it seems like it must be the ideal modality in critically ill patients, because you imagine they're going to get less hypotension and less radical electrolytes and pH changes. However, one of the side effects is a prolonged exposure to an extracorporeal circuit, which comes with its own risks, in particular clotting, for example. Um, so coagulation effects are a problem. The patients can clot. We often heparinize these patients and when you have to, to stop them from clotting and when they have to be heparinized for 24 hours a day to prevent clotting on the extracorporeal circuit, then obviously they can bleed from heparinization. And then in addition, particularly with the older circuits with the, with the maybe more rudimentary and um, pumps, then platelets can get damaged during renal replacement therapy. Not such a problem with the newer machines, but hypothermia used to be an issue. Nowadays, um, the, the machines tend to come with a thermoregulatory device. Um, so the patients don't tend to cool um, as the blood flows extracorporeally. But bear in mind, if you're also controlling the patient's blood pressure, uh, beg your pardon, the patient's temperature for 24 hours a day, then, um, then you may mask um, hyperthermia, for example. So, Patients, if, if, the, if the dialysis machine is, is controlling the patient's temperature to say 37 degrees, you may, it, you may miss some of the temperature spikes that occurs in, occur in septic patients who are receiving acute, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. When you look at intermittent te techniques, obviously now the patient's exposed to the hemodialysis machine for, for shorter periods. Um, so the volume is removed over much shorter periods of time, which may be poorly tolerated in critically ill and is associated with a higher incidence of hypotension. And quite obviously, every um, future episode or, or an ep further episode the patients develop of hypotension, they get further in, um, impairment in their renal blood flow and it may even further delay renal recovery. Other problems include the fact that the solute removal is only episodic. Um, you're only taking off the solutes um, over a three to four hour period or maybe a six to eight hour period. So this translates into inferior uremic and acid-base control. And in addition, these rapid solute shifts increase your brain water, which will increase your intracranial pressure. So if you have a patient with a raised intracranial pressure, then inter intermittent hemodialysis and renal replacement therapy is not recommended and you should aim for continuous techniques. So I hope some of you who've been in, in in your time in ICU, you've been seeing, have seen patients who receive SLED. What SLED is, is slow or sustained, low efficiency daily dialysis. Now, what this, the, the way that SLED was devised was the idea that the patient would be connected to a, a hemodialysis circuit for overnight usually. So about eight to 10 hours. Then during the day, the patient was left free from the hemodialysis machine. So they could, they had a break in their heparinization. They could go to theater or to the CT scanner, for example, without having to be the, uh, have a break in their, in their hemodialysis. So SLED is what we call a form of PIRT. And PIRT is prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy, where the patient's exposed to hemodialysis for between six and 18 hours a day. So it is a daily duration of therapy. It's supposed to take place most days. Um, and it's longer than intermittent hemodialysis, which classically just takes place over three to four hours. Um, although SLED has a reduced rate of solute clearance and net ultrafiltration, so it's less efficient than, than um, traditional intermittent hemodialysis, the idea is that a slower, more gentle treatment will be better tolerated in the critically ill patient. But in actual fact, there are very few clinical outcomes in the literature comparing SLED with intermittent hemodialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy. So there's not an enormous amount of evidence in the literature to, to say that SLED is better than um, any other technique. So what should we be doing? Continuous or intermittent hemodialysis? So which is best? 
20 years or so ago, it was widely believed that continuous renal replacement therapy was superior. And early observational trials supported this. However, more recent or, um, literature of prospective trials show that there's no difference in mortality, whether the patient gets intermittent hemodialysis, SLED, or continuous techniques. Obviously, you have to tailor your therapy appropriately. So if you have a patient with cerebral edema or hepatic failure where you're worried about them developing cerebral edema, then you should not be giving them intermittent hemodialysis because of the risk of um, arising brain water and cranial pressure. Similarly, those patients who are in, um, hemodynamically unstable, rather give them, uh, offer them continuous techniques because you're going to be taking off fluid much more gently over a longer period of time so you get much better hemodynamic stability. If your patient's at risk of bleeding and you, you don't want to anticoagulate the patient for whatever reason, or for example, if they had a traumatic brain injury and you can't anticoagulate the patients, then consider doing intermittent hemodialysis so they're only exposed to the, the circuit for three or four hours and that you don't need um, to anticoagulate the patients to stop them clotting on the circuit. So the optimum modality, I'm, I alluded to this before, there's no survival advantage of one technique over the other. We have to base it on the resource availability, local expertise and the immediate needs of the patients. Obviously intermittent techniques are favored in hemodynamic, I beg your pardon, uh, of intermittent techniques are favored in hemodynamically stable patients. But you have to be aware that even unstable patients may benefit from intermittent techniques. For example, if your patient is hemodynamically unstable because they've taken a toxin or they're hyperkalemic, then giving them a short, sharp burst of intermittent hemodialysis is going to fix their overdose or their hyperkalemia much, much more quickly than a continuous technique. So although they may be hemodynamically unstable, they will still benefit from intermittent hemodialysis. Okay, so when should we start renal replacement therapy in our patients in the ICU? What's the ideal time at which we should like kick things off and like do you phone the, the, the renal um, tech immediately and say, come, my patient looks like they're going into renal failure, let's dialyze them now. Okay, so the problem is, is that the timing of renal replacement therapy is rather uncertain. So if we com compare early renal replacement therapy to late renal replacement therapy, so you might think that it's a good thing. It sounds like a great thing to get in there early and dialyze the patient as soon as you possibly can with the idea of restoring homeostasis before complications occur. However, you have to realize that if you subject all patients who take a bit of a, a renal wobble to hemodialysis very, very early, then some of these patients may recover without the need for renal replacement therapy. So therefore, if you're instituting early renal replacement therapy in everybody, you're going to expose some patients to the risk of renal replacement therapy without them devising any, uh, deriving any benefit because they are the patients who would have got better on their own. However, if you wait before you dialyze a patient, and you wait a long time before you dialyze a patient, then some of these patients are going to get better. You're more certain that um, the patient is going to get better, but the longer you wait, the less likely the patient is to recover renal function. The problem is obviously the, the longer you wait on the off chance that you're hoping the patient will, will um, recover their renal function, then the more you delay, the more morbidity you are going to expose the patient. There's going to be more fluid accumulation, more toxin accumulation as you wait and wait and wait for the kidneys to get better. So obviously you're going to lose some patients in this group who you wait for a long period of time before you dialyze them. So obviously early treatment to try to attenuate organ injury to, to optimize the pH, electrolytes, fluids and solutes in the, in the patient sounds like an ideal um, thing to do, but obviously it's not without risk. There's the risk of um, intratherapy complications where the patient who's exposed to hemodialysis will get fluid and solute shifts, shifts. They may develop hypotension and disequilibrium syndrome. You're going to anticoagulate these patients so they may bleed. Occasionally you can get allergic reactions to component parts, but that's not usually a big problem these days with the newer um, 
filters that have been devised. And then, of course, there's complications from vascular access. There may be inadvertent um, arterial cannulation. There may be um, AV fistula formation. And as I mentioned already in the previous slide, the recovery of kidney function is more likely irrespective of renal replacement initiation. So you're going to expose a patient to risk of dialysis when that patient may recover spontaneously if you offer every single patient early therapy. With late therapy, as I said, re recovery of renal function is less likely the longer and longer you wait. And then you're going to expose the kidneys as well as the rest of the body to um, a hostile environment where you may develop other organ dysfunction from um, organ crosstalk as well as worsening renal function. So the patients are going to get uremic complications, encephalopathy, gastric um, or aspiration, plate dysfunction, bleeding, hyperkalemia, fluid overload, and inflammation. And obviously, as I mentioned already, death may occur before you actually get round to initiating therapy if you are a, a hard proponent of late renal replacement therapy. Obviously, if hemodialysis or renal replacement therapy was without complications at all, there'd be a no, it would be a no-brainer. And you could offer every single patient hemodialysis, but clearly there are issues. So if the patient, um, sorry, outside of these complications that I mentioned um, earlier in the, in the slide for urgent hemodialysis, outside of these well-recognized complications, we really don't know even now when the optimal timing of renal replacement therapy is. Obviously, if your patient's hyperkalemic, that's refractory, volume overloaded, had a, has a metabolic acidemia or uremic complications, then you must dialyze these patients early. If they don't fit into any of these categories, then we're still not sure when the optimal timing of renal replacement therapy is. So as I said, if, human, if renal replacement therapy were risk-free, there would be absolutely no debate. So if you look at the re recent literature as to the optimal timing of renal replacement therapy, there are three trials that give us some inkling into the best evidence for timing. So the, the Akiki study, the Elaine study, and the ideal ICU study. So just to touch briefly on these recent studies that try to give us some idea of when we should dialyze our patients. So the Elaine study from 2016 is a German study that most was single center and mostly looked at post-op patients. And, it, and the Akiki study was a French study with a mixed cohort of patients in the ICU and about three times the number of patients compared to the Elaine study. One thing I just want to raise your draw your attention to is um, if you look at the Elaine study, they randomized patients to the early arm within eight hours of hitting stage two um, of, of, of Kidigo. Whereas the Akiki study their definition of early renal replacement therapy was in six hours of stage three, which is actually very similar to the Elaine delayed stage. So you can see that Elaine compared very, very early with moderately delayed, whereas Akiki compared moderately delayed with very delayed. Their delayed arm was those patients who, had, who were oligonuric for more than 72 hours, had a high urea, had a high, creat uh, high potassium, and had metabolic acidosis or pulmonary edema. So these patients were really properly sick in the Akiki trials. And then another multi-center um, multi French study was called the Ideal ICU trial, but this only looked at patients with early septic shock. And just to knock this out of the waters from the get-go, this trial was actually terminated early for futility. Um, and they actually showed that there's a 29% um, recovery of renal function in those patients who had their dialysis delayed. So again, that, that talks to the fact that if you dialyze patients, um, if you wait a little bit, then your patient may well recover um, their renal function without exposing them to the harm of dialysis. So let's look at Elaine and Akiki. So what they found was Elaine found that early um, renal replacement therapy had a lower mortality that was statistically significant, 40% versus 54%. And in, a, in addition, those patients who received early renal replacement therapy had a greater success of renal recovery. They had a shorter duration of time on the, on, the, on the ventilator, shorter duration of time on the dialysis machine, and a shorter length of hospital stay. Now just... To draw your attention to something that came in for quite a lot of criticism, early versus late in the Elaine group 
translated to a difference in less than one day with starting renal replacement therapy between the groups. So that's the, um, something that I'll come back to in the next slide. So the Ikiki study, what they found was that there was no difference in 60 day survival between those who got early hemodialysis or late hemodialysis. And they also found differently from the alone study, um, no difference in ventilator free days, no difference in ICU or hospital length of stay, and also no difference in vasoactive free days. Now the difference in the two groups in starting renal replacement therapy in the Akiki study was nearly three days compared to less than one day in the Elaine study. So yeah, Elaine favored early hemodialysis or renal replacement therapy, whereas the Akiki study showed there was no difference between late or early um, intervention. The one thing that the Elaine trial did see was that there was more central line associated bloodstream infections twice as many in the group who received early hemodialysis, which is not particularly surprising because they're going to have their catheters in for much longer. So the problem is, is when you look at the critiques in the literature is that neither Elaine nor Akiki provide definitive answers um, when we're trying to find the optimal timing for hemodialysis or renal replacement therapy. The, there was a big problem with the Elaine study and that is that it was powered to detect an 18% reduction in mortality if the patient was given early renal replacement therapy. And it's felt that this is an implausible treatment effect for any ICU intervention, let alone renal replacement therapy. Nothing we do in ICU has an 18% reduction in mortality. The other important thing in the, in the statistics of the Elaine trial is that it has what they call a very low fragility index. So what this means is in the Elaine study has this fragility index of three. So this means that if three more deaths had occurred in the early group or three fewer deaths had occurred in the delayed group, then the trial would be non-significant. So you can see that there's a very fine line. You don't need a lot of, of, of many more deaths in either direction to make this trial non-significant. In addition, as I mentioned previously, a lot of the critique came from the fact that the difference in time between starting renal replacement therapy in the two groups was less than one day. And it's highly unlikely that this would translate into a mortality difference. So the feeling in the literature currently is that Elaine is probably a, a less robust trial than a Kiki, and that the larger multicenter Kiki trial shifts the balance to favor a more conservative strategy when it comes to commencing renal replacement therapy. I'm never one for um, putting a lot of faith in subgroup analyses when obviously you're, um, you're not powered to look at these interventions. But what's one, a couple of things of interest is that in the Akiki post hoc analysis, 10% of the patients actually had chronic kidney disease. And they found in the Akiki subgroup analysis that renal replacement therapy, early renal replacement therapy, compared to delayed renal replacement therapy, actually was associated with a higher incidence of death in those group of patients who actually had chronic kidney disease. So it seems in a Kiki, offering early renal replacement therapy to a patient who has chronic kidney disease is associated with a worse outcome. They also looked at patients with who vulnerable patients, for example, those with septic shock and ARDS. Um, and you might think that patients with ARDS do better if you institute renal replacement therapy earlier. And similarly, those in septic shock do better because you um, are going, or, or rather, or, or septic shock may do, do worse if you institute it earlier because you're subjecting them to more um, hemodynamic perturbations. But in actual fact, there's no difference um, in, in the septic shock group or the ARDS group between early or delayed renal replacement therapy. So the one thing it does show is that in these groups of patients where, um, who are relatively fragile, that exposing them to a relatively risky procedure can be avoided. And you do have a little um, window of time by which you can wait a bit until your patient stabilizes somewhat. So the bottom line is who knows? We really don't know when to dialyze a patient because the literature seems to favor that we should maybe wait a little bit but how long a little bit of time translates to, people don't really know. So the bottom line is that the findings trials of the trials to date appear to favor delayed renal, risk, uh, renal replacement strategy in acute kidney injury. How long that delayed time period is, it's difficult to say. 
But the one thing you must do is you must try to avoid urgent or emergent indications. It is likely to cause harm to your patients if, they, if they're allowed to develop uremic complications like pericarditis um, and then cephalopathy. There's a larger prag pragmatic trial that is currently recruiting and that's called the START AKI trial. So maybe in another year or so, if I'm still here, we can um, look at those results. Okay, so how much do we dialyze the patients? What, what are, what's the optimal dose of renal replacement therapy? So we probably aren't doing this correctly. We often say, oh, let's just take off a liter of fluid or two liters of fluid in our patients. But in actual fact, we need to properly measure um, urea kinetics for patients who we want to dose dialysis for and if we're doing intermittent techniques and the total effluent volume in patients who are getting um, continuous techniques. The important thing to realize is bigger is not necessarily better. You can over dialyze patients. And I, I don't just mean about taking off too much fluid. I'm talking about a, a too rapid um, achievement of normal results, which can not only cause disequilibrium syndrome and an increase in brain water, but you can also remove antibiotics and other crucial meds by dialyzing the patients hard. You can remove uh, amino acids and deplete them, the patients of essential minerals. So there seems to be a ceiling dose above, above which dialyzing these patients is, no benef is not beneficial and may well be harmful. And an op unfortunately for us and for the patient, an optimal dose has yet to be defined. So obviously it's a, a very much a, an area where we need to provide precision renal replacement therapy, where we can try and aim to dialyze or ultrafiltrate depending on the patient who's lying in front of us. It's very difficult to to lump all the patients together because we, we're not dealing with a homogeneous population. So when it comes to stopping clotting um, of the dialysis circuit, any exposure to an extracorporeal circuit is going to run the patient at risk of clotting. So commonly we use heparin infusions. Some places we use citrate. Um, we stopped doing that a while ago because of a few issues with, um, with calcium kinetics. So, Citrate binds calcium. So the patients, if you have to replace calcium aggressively in the patients who you, in whom you're using citrate anticoagulation, um, otherwise they become profoundly hypokalemic. To use blood flow rate for a short duration, the patient's less likely to clot. But patients who are exposed to SLED or other pyrit, um, and um, continuous renal replacement therapy have a longer duration and are more likely to need anticoagulation. Um, the problem is there's many, many, many unanswered questions when we're talking about hemodialysis or hemofiltration in patients in the ICU. We don't know the optimal time for, for instituting renal replacement therapy. We don't know what defines early and late. We don't know which modality of, of renal replacement therapy is the best. We don't really know much about the correct dialysis membrane material. Although the new um, materials we're using in um, this generation of, of filters seem to be less immunogenic, we don't know the preferred anticoagulation for our patients and we don't know the correct dose intensity of dialysis or the adequacy of therapy. And with all these unanswered questions, quite obviously we have to tailor make our dialysis to each particular patient. It's very difficult to, to generalize. So being a human is way too complicated and it's time to be a unicorn. Okay, just the last little bit, I want to touch on a couple of, of issues with um, uh, renal replacement therapy and critically ill kidneys in the ICU. So yes, it's a gratifying sight when you have a bucket load of pee in the urinary bag at the end of the bed. But does taking a patient and giving them furosemide and converting them from oliguric renal failure into non-oliguric renal failure make any difference? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Some of you may have read a bit about the furosemide stress test. And what this is, is a, a dynamic functional assessment of future renal function. So it's getting our crystal ball out and trying to predict whether or not this patient is going to need to be dialyzed. So the idea behind the furosemide stress test is that if the patient is, has a urine output of less than 100 mils an hour and they're in aching stage two or stage three, then you need to give them a bolus of furosemide. And how much you give depends on whether they normally take furosemide. 
You then look at the urine output in the two hours after giving them the bolus of furosemide. If the patients do not put out or, or put out less than 200 mils in the following two hours, then this predicts the progression to them developing acute kidney injury um, network stage three or the need for renal replacement therapy with a reasonably high sensitivity, but not a particularly high specificity. And I'm not a big, I'm not a big believer in these kind of um, in these kind of tests because I don't know that it helps enormously because you are going to institute renal replacement therapy anyway in the patient in our setting if the patient deteriorates or develops um, any complications or or, um, or you deem it to be important from a timing perspective. However, I suppose you can say that if you're pay, if you're in a in an environment where you can't perform um, renal replacement therapy, then if you give um, your furosemide stress test to the patient and they fail it and they don't put that much urine, then maybe it's a decent time to transfer that patient to a facility that can provide renal replacement therapy rather than wait until they become more unstable because you think they're unlikely to, to um, escape from needing uh, renal replacement therapy. And similarly, if the patient passes the um, furosemide stress test, then you can maybe argue that we shouldn't be starting early renal replacement therapy because this patient's in with um, a fair chance that their renal, refunction, renal function may recover. So what about furosemide in other circumstances? Well, yes, absolutely. I'm a firm believer that furosemide is a fantastic drug if the patient is fluid overloaded or in those patients in whom you're trying to promote a negative fluid balance. We do know that furosemide um, as a preventative strategy for the development of renal failure is not beneficial and it's potentially harmful. So I think the bottom line for only using furosemide in acute kidney injury is that Lasix or furosemide is for the lungs, not for a low urine output. And this has been um, supported by level 1C evidence um, in, in, um, in the literature that acute kidney injury patients who have a low urine output, you, you can consider giving furosemide if they have pulmonary congestion. The use of furosemide in acute kidney injury does not magically kickstart the kidneys. It does not magically fix the underlying problem and it may cause harm. You are allowed to consider it for the, helping to manage hyperkalemia and hypercalcemia until you can institute more definitive management. But really, only think about giving furosemide um, if the patient has pulmonary congestion in acute kidney injury. And this was the bottom line with the guidelines. We recommend not using diuretics for the treatment of cardiovascular um, syndrome acute kidney injury or cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular um, system um, acute kidney injury. And the same applies for patients who have um, acute kidney injury for, from sepsis or hypovolemia or hypotension. Don't use furosemide without a good reason. And then the last little bit that I want to, to look at is drug dosing in renal failure. This might be one of the reasons why um, acute kidney injury patients have a higher mortality or certainly it's contributory. So let's suppose you have a patient who's septic. In sepsis, you have circulating endotoxins and exotoxins that damage the um, endothelium of the capillaries. So the patients develop leaky capillaries and fluid moves from the intravascular space to the interstitial space. And where fluid goes, hydrophilic um, uh, drugs, in particular, in this scenario, I want to talk about hydrophilic antibiotics, move with the fluid. Now, the vast majority of, of antibiotics we use in clinical practice are hydrophilic. So when you have a septic patient with capillary leak and you give antibiotics to, they have a big increase in volume of distribution and the antibiotic will move from the intravascular space to the interstitial space. So their serum or plasma or, or circulating concentration is actually reduced. So you're likely to get antimicrobial failure. In addition, now you have a septic patient, they often drop their blood pressure, so you give them a fluid bolus. Unfortunately, the fluid bolus doesn't stay intravascularly and it expands the interstitium, which again is going to increase the volume of distribution of hydrophilic antibiotics and lead to antimicrobial failure. Septic patients have a hyperdynamic state and an increase in cardiac output. If you have an increased cardiac output, you have an increase in renal blood flow. And hey, guess what happens? You 
the blood circulates more around past your kidneys and your kidneys pee out the drug. And of particular importance, it pees out really eliminated antibiotics. Patients have diminished microvascular perfusion, which means areas, um, certain areas of poor perfusion will have the antibiotic won't be getting delivered to those areas um, that are poorly perfused. And then patients, critically ill patients, often have hypoalbuminemia. As you remember, albumin is an acute phase reactant or acute phase protein. So patients, when they become critically ill, they, be, they develop a relative hypoalbuminemia. So what this means is that if you now have a low albumin, you're going to reduce the unbound fraction of any drugs that we give to the patient. So you may think, well, that's absolutely fantastic because if you have now have an unbound fraction of um, higher unbound fraction of antibiotics, then surely the antibiotic can go and attack the, the microbes much more easily rather than being in, in this cumbersome um, partnership with albumin. But the problem is, is you're now taking your, your, anti, your antibiotic and your albumin and you, and you, what was once a big molecule is now becoming a much smaller molecule. So as your blood circulates through your kidneys, you're going to have an increase in renal clearance because now you've just got a much smaller molecule, which is your antibiotic, that is getting increased um, renal clearance. Now, obviously, this, you may think, well, what's this got to do with renal failure? And I'll, I'm going to <laughs> tell you that in a moment. Because the problem is um, that a lot of our patients, even critically ill patients before they develop renal failure have a concept of augmented renal clearance. And augmented renal clearance is kind of a supranormal renal function that is estimated to occur in up to two thirds of all patients in the ICU and particularly those young patients who are septic, um, mechanically ventilated burns patients are at particular risk of developing augmented renal clearance. Mostly it's because of glomerular hyperfiltration, but it's not just because of this and it may be um, due to an increase in cardiac output and fluid loading. And it can also actually occur in early acute kidney injury before we're actually picking up that the patient is developing acute kidney failure. And these patients often have a creatinine clearance of greater than 130 mils a minute. When you think about a normal creatinine clearance, it's up to about 150, 120 mils per minute. And some patients can have creatinine clearances in excess of 250 mils a minute. And the, the rapidity at which you clear your antibiotics um, renally is proportional to your creatinine clearance. So if you've got augmented renal clearance, your creatinine clearance is high and your antibiotic clearance is high. So you're going to, going to get antimicrobial failure. So not surprisingly, 82% of patients with acute renal, uh, I beg your pardon, with augmented renal clearance don't achieve therapeutic concentrations with standard doses. And then just quickly to show you that um, the evidence is way, way, way more in excess that we are underdosing uh, ICU patients um, with antibiotics, not overdosing. So we're just not giving enough. And the problem is if we're giving inadequate drug concentrations, particularly of antibiotics, then we're just not going to kill the microbes, it's going to compromise the patient and promote the development of multidrug resistant organisms. And importantly, your patient's just not going to get better. So how does that tie in with renal failure? Well, it's often a knee jerk reaction. You say, uh oh, the patient's renal function is deteriorating, their creatinine's doubled. We must um, give them renally adjusted doses of drugs. And particularly, people are very cognizant of the fact that we're giving too much antibiotics. So, with all the best will in the world, they're worried about um, toxicity of accumulation of antibiotics in renal failure, and they cut the dose of antibiotics. Now, why that's a bad idea, let me show you if you've got a patient with sepsis and acute kidney injury. Yes, clearance is no longer a problem. You're not going to clear the antibiotic, but um, the patient will still have endotoxins and exotoxins which damage the endothelium. They're going to get fluid resuscitation initially, and they're going to get a massive volume of distribution. And this is a big problem because if you now go straight to lower doses of, of antibiotics because you're worried about accumulation and toxicity, then you're going to get antimicrobial failure because of this big volume of distribution. And so your, your um, antibiotic just becomes very, very dilute in the bloodstream. So your volume of distribution impacts on the initial few doses. Um, obviously, lipophilic drugs are minimally affected. 
But in actual fact, we probably should be giving bigger than normal doses of hydrophilic drugs, even in patients with acute kidney injury and sepsis, because they still have a big um, increase um, in volume of distribution. Obviously, renal failure impacts on renal clearance, and it's down them cleared much more slowly. So reduce, but you have to bear in mind that some patients actually have external elimination. And there is some evidence to suggest that in renal failure, some, drug, some drugs actually have um, an up or like an upkick in extra renal elimination, um, such as transintestinal hepatic and biliary elimination. So although your initial few doses are important with volume redistribution, and we should be giving big doses in septic patients, even if they've got renal failure, obviously prolonged dosing may need modification. You don't want to expose the patients who are now no longer clearing the drug to toxicity. But I do think that a knee-jerk reaction to reducing the dose of antibiotics in septic patients and acute kidney injury perhaps does more harm than good. So that's where I'm going to finish with just the one thing um, to ponder upon is that when you're faced with a patient with renal failure, always look at the patient in front of you. Don't just extrapolate trying to lump all renal replacement therapy, all, all acute kidney injury patients um, together. They're different. Each patient is unique. You have to look at what's the biggest threat to that patient. Is it volume overload? Is it acidemia? Is it hyperkalemia? Do they need a greater doses of antibiotics or even other drugs, for example. But always, rather than just trying to come up with a, a um, protocol for managing a patient with hemo for, who needs renal replacement therapy, look at each patient individually and then try and um, come up with a, 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 a policy that best suits the patient in front of you. Thank you. That's it, guys. <laughs>